Hello and welcome to Givey Connect Plus, a podcast series where we talk to local charities in the UK and put the spotlight on their exciting projects and initiatives. I'm your host, Fizza Sirheel, and our guest for today is Becky from Safer Waves. Following their setup in 2019, Safer Waves aim to provide support to merchant seafarers who have experienced sexual assault, sexual harassment, or gender discrimination on board. This is because such experiences can be hard to talk about, even within the supportive environment provided by existing seafarer welfare and support organizations. While progress has been made in discussing bullying and harassment within the Merchant Navy, it remains difficult to find a safe space to talk about assault and rape. Now a registered charity, Safer Waves aim to create that safe space, provide information, and signpost to other suitable welfare charities globally and locally. They are working with seafarers, employers, and organizations to build a strong network of support. Thank you so much for joining us today, Becky, and for giving us your time here at Givey Connect Plus. A very warm welcome to you. Can I please ask you to start us off by firstly introducing yourself, the work that you do, and also some of the recent um, events or initiatives that you've involved yourself in with relation to Safer Waves. Yeah, hi, thank you for having me on. Um, So I'm Becky, I I founded Safer Waves. Um, I'm a chief officer in the Merchant Navy. I've been at sea since 2006 um, on a a variety of different vessels. And Safer Waves, I started as a website in November 2019, which was the purpose of it was to provide support and information to seafarers who might be quite isolated in their work um, and to let them know that if they were going through these kinds of things that they they weren't alone and um, there was support out there and it was I, I started by trying to simplify and consolidate the information that is available to seafarers so that it would be in one easy place for them to to find because there can be quite a lot of complications with regards to how do you handle um, a case of sexual assault on board? How do you report it? Uh, so that's something we're working on all the time to to try and improve the information that's available. Awesome. So it really seems like you've been involved since a very long time now. 2006 is such a long time ago, but thank you for introducing yourself. Um, so firstly, with relation to Safer Waves, and when I was going through your official website, um, there was a recent project um, that came into my attention, and you're raising funds for it at the moment, which is the Anonymous Email Support Service, and it provides not only emotional support, but also information to seafarers, right? So if you could please tell us more about this particular project um, and elaborate on that, please. Yeah, so we we ran a, a recent survey, um, and one of the things that came up from the survey, it seemed to be that the what happened after sexual assault or an incident of sexual harassment often seemed to have a more traumatic effect or just as traumatic effect as the actual incident. So the fact that people felt there was a lack of support um, they didn't know what to do next. The people they reported to, they didn't know what to do either. Um, and the fact that when it happens um, at sea, b- victims have to carry on living with the person that's harassing or abusing them. So, you know, you know there could be an incident and then the next day they have to have breakfast with that person, work with that person, lunch, work, dinner, and then just do the whole thing again for another four months. And what we felt was that that made it very difficult for people to process and it 
worsened the impact of the incident. So we wanted to have somewhere that people could just express what had happened to them. Um, and we decided to do that as an anonymous email service, um, partly because when you're talking about seafarers, they don't have access to particularly good phone communication. So a helpline uh, would have been more difficult to manage and more difficult for people to access. So we felt that email gave people a chance to, to access it from most types of vessel. Um, yeah, and, and we just, some people I think have been dealing with incidents like these for, for a very long time, I mean, they might have happened 30 years ago, but because it's never really been discussed, they haven't had the chance to express what happened and, and possibly to move on from that. So um, we wanted to give seafarers a chance to do that. Thank you. That sounds really interesting in terms of how you ran a survey and there was a need and you recognized that need to um, create that support service. So huge hats off to you guys for recognizing that. And thank you for sharing that with us. So in terms of, um, you know, there's this project going on as well. And, you know, people look at your project, they look at your mission, they would want to try and get involved themselves, right? So, you know, donation is one thing that's monetary support, but is it like possible to find other ways to contribute to your mission, perhaps volunteering or any other opportunities that you guys have available for the people who would want to get involved? And if you could tell us about that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we're currently recruiting volunteers for the email support service and we're looking for volunteers at the moment in the South Hampshire area. So Southampton, Portsmouth and all the areas in between. Um, we're always looking for people to contribute to the website, particularly seafarers, if they have any relevant experience that they feel could add to the website, or if there's something that they feel hasn't been mentioned at all that should be mentioned. Um, so we're always looking for people's input and and advice on that. Um, and yeah, in terms of we're not we're not actively looking for any other types of volunteer at the moment. But of course, if there's people that feel they've got skills that could be useful to us, we'd always welcome them to get in touch. Um, and apart from that, we just we need people to help spread the word and you know, follow us on social media and, and help. And particularly when we do get the email support up and running, we'll need people to help share that um, email address so that it reaches everybody that might need it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that's good that there's other um, opportunities for other people to explore as well. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm not sure if the email support service has already been launched. Has it already been launched? No, no, we're looking at launching it at the end of June. Uh, I see. So is um, in terms of funding, um, is there like a specific like deadline or perhaps like a launch date that you have in mind and you would like people to like contribute by that day perhaps? Uh, yes, I suppose the beginning of June really um, we need to have everything sort of ready to go ready for because we're doing some training in June so we need um, everything ready to go so that when the training is complete we can um, launch at the end of June. Awesome thank you I'm just making that clear so thank you for that. So that was all the basic, I guess, information about some of your recent um, projects that you're you're having and you're gonna that that are kind of come up very soon. Um, but I'd just like to like step back a little bit and perhaps like get into more to the deeper aspects of your project. You know, um, I was exploring your website a little bit, and um, I read a little bit about your story, and it said something about you know fostering a unique environment for merchants that are on board and who are vulnerable, who've gone through that trauma. So I'd just like to hear about this in your own words and perhaps a little more about how this, you know, project like actually 
sprang up and how it came into action and what were the motivations um, that went into it and like when and how did you decide that you wanted to do this? So if you could please elaborate on that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think life at sea can be difficult for a lot of people to understand. Um, it is a very different environment to to most working environments ashore. Um, and it's meant that seafarers are quite isolated uh there's there's a rank structure on board which means that orders from those above you have to be obeyed and if it's an emergency that's that's imperative to the the safety of the ship and and the crew so that is ingrained in you that you must follow the orders of of people who are supervising you um there's also very little in the way of peer support. So if there is an incident and, and somebody experiences sexual assault, there often isn't anybody else that they can talk to on board. Um, and so we just, we felt that it was important to have a service that was specifically tailored to seafarers so that they understood, or we understood the challenges that they faced in terms of their environment, but also in terms of actually accessing um, services ashore, because you might have great services in your hometown, but if you're only home for two months, it's not long enough to get on the waiting list and then actually complete counselling or whatever other service you would like to access. Um, and I think it's always good to speak to somebody who understands the background uh, so you're not having to explain everything from scratch. Um, so, as I said, I've I've been at sea for 15 years now. Is that right? Yeah, 15 years. Um, <laughs> and I'm now in a more senior position. And I feel like being part part of being in that position, being a chief officer or being a captain, is supporting the younger generation as they come through. And it's always been a big part of life on board that you train the younger ones, that you keep them safe, that you don't let any harm come to them when they're on deck or in the engine room because you're the ones with the experience and you're the ones that can say, no, that's dangerous, don't do that, and um, and support them in that way. So I just see it as an extension of that, really. I'm, I'm now in a position of authority and, and I wanted to, to make sure that the generation that coming through behind us are, are safe and are not going through this kind of trauma completely unsupported um I'd spoken to a couple of other women about the harassment that they'd faced when they were on board and one of them was probably 10 years younger than me and she was just saying it's so nice to be able to speak to somebody um that knows what I mean um and yeah I just I started thinking how could how could we reach more people um, and get the message across to to more people that if something does happen, it's not their fault, and they deserve to be supported through that. So yeah, so we started the the website and um, and built it up from there. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And it's like this, this one industry is like, I have no exposure to it, but it's amazing that you decided to create the service tailored to those people who've gone through those um, experiences. And, you know, other people might not recognize that their problems are really like significant. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. So obviously, um, you, this is a really big project and you've probably encountered lots of people, people's cases and like talk to them about it, given them support. So, you know, I'm just wondering if there's been any significant perhaps challenges or like setbacks that you've faced up, up, up until this point. Um, and if you could like tell us about that as well. Yep. Uh, well, I think it was always going to be challenging starting a, a charity from scratch um, but because of COVID, um, a lot of things have taken longer than I thought they would. Um, various applications for bank accounts to the Charity Commission, all those things. People are, you know, struggling to run their own their own services with the challenges that we're facing. Um, 
But in some ways, I think we've benefited from the fact that people are now much more used to operating um, remotely. And for example, I've, I've been able to talk to people all around the country on Zoom or all around the world on Zoom. Um, and I don't think people would have been so comfortable doing that up, up until last year. And I find it easier to kind of to make a connection with somebody if if you're on Zoom rather than on the phone, so you feel like you've actually had a meeting with them. So I've, I've been able to access support and advice from all sorts of different organisations. Um, and the other the other area where it's helped us out, I think, is it's given us more of a choice of training because there's there's a lot of training that up until last year people wouldn't have dreamt of delivering it any other way apart from face to face but now people are happy to deliver it via zoom and um that's that sort of worked in our favor so yeah so no major setbacks i don't think uh, it's it's a constant challenge but it's um you can see it moving forward so it, it's worth it definitely it's absolutely worth it and it's you know COVID has touched on every part of our life and it comes with both benefits and, you know, um, disadvantages, but it's good that you've been able to um, benefit from the good sides of it as well. And you've proven to be like adaptable and also resilient. So thank you so much for telling us about that. Um, you know, you've like um, accumulated quite a bit of experience now perhaps. And if there's a little bit of advice or perhaps any tips that you have for other people in the charity sector who are pro like probably, or perhaps are trying to achieve the same goals as you. And if you could give them like a, an advice or two, uh, what would that be? What would that look like? I think it would just be to talk to as many people as possible because I've been so amazed by how many people are really willing to help in the charity sector um they want to help people that are starting new things and um the other thing is is to take advantage of training opportunities that are offered because there's so many great organizations which offer free training sessions to people involved in charities and i don't know because I've only just started this, I don't know whether a lot of this is in response to COVID. Um, some of it definitely is with regards to sort of moving your services online and things like that. But all that has been really helpful for us because ours would have always been online. Um, so yeah, make make the most of the the knowledge and experience of people that that already do this, um, and, and yeah, and, and take advantage of all those free training sessions. <laughs> Excellent. That's a very good tip indeed. Um, you can benefit from other people's experiences and knowledge like nothing else. So thank you for that. Um, and just the last question in this section would be perhaps to ask you to share with us an inspiring quote or perhaps an inspiring motto that you live by or it gives you strength on a daily basis or something like you got from partaking in this initiative and you just live by this one quote or one motto that any would like to share that with us as well? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been such a good learning experience and I, I've, I've had to get to know all sorts of different things I never thought would, would be part of it. Um, and at the beginning, when I wasn't sure whether to take it any further, because initially I, I just wanted to make a website and that was it and then people it was really well received and people started saying to me so what are you going to do next where are you going to take this project next um and I didn't know I didn't know whether it was a good idea to to take it forward or if it would just be too much hard work too much stress and I know it's probably a really cheesy quote and I know it's been said a thousand times and attributed to the wrong people but I always said that quote, if not me, who, and if not now, when, and I, th I thought, why shouldn't, why shouldn't I be that person that takes it forward? Because I, I realized that nobody else was going to move the project forward in the way that I wanted to do it. 
So yeah, so sometimes I say that to myself. <laughs> Wow, that's a very, very, very inspiring quote indeed. And you know, you just have to remind yourself that um, overthinking, overthinking is something that's quite unavoidable, even for me. So that also gave me a little bit of strength. So thank you so much for sharing that amazing quote with us. And I hope you can um, take this project even forward and prosper even more and expand your network through this amazing project. Um, just before we conclude our podcast series, I'm just I'm curious to know if you've got some uh, future short-term goals that you have in mind, and this is what you want to achieve in the near future, and what would those uh, look like, and what are those? Uh, well, we have so many ideas. I, I'm constantly having ideas about what I want to do, um, and at the moment, it's about trying to keep it all at a manageable level. Um, so it doesn't get too big too fast, but we'd like to develop online chat as well because the the survey that we ran suggested that online chat would be um, Seafarer's preferred method of of getting in touch. But initially, we're starting with email because it's um, sort of less labour intensive in terms of volunteers and hours that we would need to put in. So that's something we'd like to develop. Um, we will just continue working on the website to improve all that information. We're, um, it's very, very difficult at sea to report and um, seek justice for crimes because you, you can end up with um, two or three jurisdictions involved, the, the crew member, the, the victim, the perpetrator, the, the flag of the ship, the port state where the ship was, all those all those factors come into play. So we're trying to simplify that and we're working on that all the time behind the scenes with, um, with lawyers. And um, the other thing we'd like to do is we'd like to develop some training or even just a, a simple fact sheet for senior crew on board ships so that they know how to respond if they um if they have somebody who reports an, an incident of sexual violence to them because as i said before it makes that first response makes so much difference and if they they say the wrong thing it can just really compound the trauma that the victim feels and i think the majority of the time that wouldn't be intentional. That would just be not knowing what to say or what to do. So, um, yeah, we'd like to put something together to do with that. Excellent. All of those sound like very interesting and very exciting projects. And I hope all of the successes do come your way and you can expand your um, project e projects even more and also the entire organization. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, Becky. It was wonderful speaking to you today and hearing about a Safer Waves, their mission. And it's been amazing talking to you today. Thank you. No, thank you for having us on. It's great. And on that note, we would like to conclude this episode of Givey Connect Plus. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Givey Connect Plus. We will be returning with another episode with another special guest very soon. But until then, goodbye and take care.